The third reality I wish to point out is what I term society's permissiveness of corruption. In recent times and in many parts of the world, we are witnessing a worrying phenomenon. Corruption continues to flourish uninhibited with no voices of protest raised against it. We, the members of society, in fact, have come to accept corruption as an evil that will always be with us, and very little can be done to eliminate it. It is my contention that the greatest tragedy that we face in our countries today is not the high levels of corruption that we witness. The tragedy lies in the indifference that we, the people, have towards corruption. We have normalized corruption. So corruption has become normal. We go further and we rationalize corruption. We find good reasons to exonerate those accused of corruption. In fact, the corrupt are not without a huge legion of supporters and beneficiaries of their ill-gotten wealth. Those who speak or act against the corrupt are labeled to be political or tribal, and at times we've seen heads of government institutions vilified simply for doing their job. The corrupt live among us. We know them, and at times we even elect them into positions of power. This is a reality of the world we live in. It is quite amazing to observe that there are instances when society elects people with well-known corruption backgrounds, and yet we expect them to undergo some form of metanoia and repent from their ways when given the levers of power. This is about, it's almost like asking fish to fry itself. We as society are at times equally to blame for the corruption taking place in our communities. Admittedly, at times society takes a back seat out of frustration with the lack of progress in the fight against corruption. It is frustrating to note how corruption cases involving high profile persons in society drag on for years before getting to any conclusion. And yet the law enforcement agencies and the courts of law act expeditiously on cases involving the small fish. A number of our chapters conduct bribe payers index surveys which examine people's experiences with corruption. And one question whose answers are disheartening relates to whether people who have experienced acts of bribery have reported these to the relevant authorities. And the answer is no. We have no faith that these agencies will do anything about it. We need to really think about that. How can we restore faith in public institutions given the mandate to investigate corruption? The fourth reality I'd like to share, or a perspective of the reality I'd like to share, is what I call rising impunity and political patronage. High levels of corruption are now accompanied by unprecedented rise in impunity for corruption. In Transparency International, we consider impunity as getting away with bending of the law, beating the system, or escaping punishment. Impunity is anathema to the fight against corruption. And due to impunity, the corrupt have lost all manner of fear for public resources and property. The corrupt do not fear the consequences of the law because through their corrupt deeds, they can circumvent all authorities, including the courts of law. It is the culture of impunity that has provided a fertile ground for new forms of corruption, some which violate human rights and threatens peace. Impunity makes the corrupt bored, and quite often, the corrupt fight back. The reality has to be faced that with the rise in impunity, the corrupt threaten, they harass, and at times harm anti-corruption activists, investigative journalists, law enforcement officers, and all other authorities. Last year, we were honoring uh, an investigative journalist from Europe who had been killed simply for investigating corrupt activities involving people uh, linked to uh, the powers that be. Impunity for corruption compromises the efficacy of investigations and prosecutions of allegations of corruption, particularly for those persons who are politically connected. Impunity may equally compromise the independence of the judicial system when allowed to prevail. 
impunity gives rise to state capture. And I'm sure you have seen the definition of state capture of private interests really taking over the shaping of public policy and uh, national affairs. And an example is in South Africa. People have heard of the three brothers, the Gupta brothers, originally from India, who went to invest in South Africa. And not only did they get to invest in South Africa, they were involved in milking the nation of its resources. The Gupta brothers went to the extent of determining who could be in cabinet. They had meetings with people that they wanted to place specifically as cabinet ministers or director generals to facilitate their ill-intended uh, um, schemes. In a recent book done by Robin Renwick, I'm sure uh, High Commissioner High Commission Nor Robin Renwick used to be ambassador in South Africa. He's written a book called How to Steal a Country. That is what impunity can do. It can lead not only to the loss of public resources, but the loss of a country. What was happening in South Africa during President Zuma's reign reminded me of the infamous statement of one Oscar Ramundo Benavides, a field marshal and former president of Peru, who once quipped, for my friends, everything. For my enemies, the law. And I'm sure we see that quite often. So for my friends, you can do everything. But for my enemies, the law. So in order to successfully crack down on corruption, we should equally tackle the rise in impunity. Similarly, political patronage remains another growing concern in countries around the world. Patronage is prevalent and used uh, by party loyalists to, access, to have unrestricted and unfair access to public contracts and tenders. The beneficiaries of this patronage often do not have the necessary qualifications and experience to execute these public uh, works. But they receive favors simply on account of their membership to the ruling party or their connectedness to those with power. Patronage does not guarantee the quality of public works or uh, goods supplied by this group which we in our region in sub-Saharan sub Africa, we sometimes call tenderpreneurs. I'm sure you've heard of tenderpreneurs. They're entrepreneurs whose only livelihood is about identifying government tenders and getting those tenders. And usually these tenderpreneurs have no skills whatsoever, but they have the right connections to identify tenders uh, which they get and often are poorly executed or they end up selling these same contracts to other contractors to execute. There are a number of people who make a living simply by taking advantage of their relationship with those in power. The second last reality or perspective I present is that we need to change our approach in combating corruption. I've had the privilege of being involved in the work of Transparency International for the last 17 years and I've had the great honor to travel to many parts of the world and witness firsthand the work of our chapters and several other organizations involved in combating corruption. I'm also aware of the efforts of many well-intentioned governments who genuinely seek to reduce the levels of corruption in their countries. Such governments have passed laws, established structures to address corruption. Similarly, the private sector, the business community, and in the intergovernmental agencies continue to pour millions of dollars in anti-corruption efforts. We have international and regional conventions on corruption. We have a number of corruption measurement tools like the Corruption Perception Index. We have a lot of studies conducted by think tanks and universities right throughout the world. Of concern to me and many others is that over the years, Colossal investments have been made in the anti-corruption industry. I call it an anti-corruption industry. Yet, this is not commensurate with the results on the ground. As earlier alluded to, despite this investment, corruption is still prevalent. It would seem the more money we pour into anti-corruption activities, the more corruption we have to contend with. And while there are several reasons that can be attributed to this sad state of affairs, I would like to suggest that the traditional approach to combating corruption has had limited impact. The approach is about finding wrong doors, investigating them, prosecuting them, 
and securing a conviction. It is intended in this scheme of things that the conviction sends a strong signal to would-be offenders that corruption does not pay. However, the reality is that, we have to, that we have to face is that convictions have never stopped people from engaging in corruption. We witness in many countries where those alleged to be corrupt easily hire the best lawyers in town to beat the system. Admittedly, some judiciaries are independent and capable of deciding on cases on their merit. But it is also true that there is corruption in the judiciary as well. In 2007, Transparency International prepared a global corruption report which focused on judicial systems around the world. And there's one statement made by one respondent when asked if he had encountered corruption in the judiciary in his country, which stood out for me. This respondent said, why would anyone hire expensive lawyers when you can bribe the judge? That's the reality. So why go and pay expensive lawyers when you can ju just bribe the judge? We emphasize too much on the efficacy of the law and its ability to nip in the bud or manner of corruption. But we need to go beyond the law and deal with building integrity in the public and the private sector, in young children as uh, TTTI is doing. We should seek to build individuals, communities, and institutions anchored on integrity. Public servants should not engage in corruption because they are afraid of the legal consequences once caught. But they should abstain from this vice because they respect and uphold the value of honesty in their dealings. Corruption should be fought from the ethical point as well. I should have also highlight that our approach in cracking down on corruption is many reactive. We react to instances of corruption. And many a times, these unscrupulous individuals are miles ahead in planning their corrupt schemes. As anti-corruption activists, I always say we, we act a little bit like the, uh, the airport security people. So terrorists use liquids. You can't take liquids on board. Terrorists use shoes. Shoes have to be removed. Uh, so we, one wonders what they'll be using next before we are asked to remove that. But we're not anticipating what is it that they will try and use next. Laptops were stopped, but that's the way we also react. We're a bit reactive as anti-corruption activists. So we need to start spending and investing time, not just in analyzing and agonizing about the corruption of today, which is important, but we should also look ahead to the future and corruption. In Transparency International, we have embarked upon a process of vision in the future. We are looking at trends around the world and analyzing what corruption will look like in the future against the background of several developments, such as the emergence of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin technologies, artificial intelligence, the new global financial system. We are asking ourselves a question, if these developments do come to pass, what should we be doing to make Transparency International fit for purpose in the execution of its mandate. We need to start thinking about the future. Yes, we, we are doing everything possible as activists, as practitioners, to deal with the corruption, but the reality is that it does still exist. I'm cautious that I'm an African and we love telling stories, so let me conclude by making a few suggestions for Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago has to utilize this resolve by the many stakeholders gathered here today to find solutions to different forms of corruption that the country is facing. You should seek ways to improve your standing on the CPI. I noticed that you've been at the same position. You're doing much better though than Zambia. Uh, Zambia for any information lost uh, Dion. We were at 36, now at 35. So you're in the 40s, so probably you are miles ahead of Zambia. But you should seek to improve that standing. And there are several things that you can do, and I'm sure as we go through the course of the day, we'll listen to a number of suggestions on what needs to be done. But in this crackdown on corruption, the society, the ordinary man and woman out there, should be carried along. Everyone has a stake in addressing corruption. Quite often, the mistake we make is that we assume that either government or some experts will be the ones to bring about 
the change that we desire. Everyone has a stake, and you should carry along every member of society in finding solutions to, to the corruption that you're dealing with. You need clear, innovative strategies based on good analysis of the state of corruption. You, these strategies should be developed and implemented. I should say that one of the challenges we face in Africa, where I come from, is that we are not short of good plans. We are short of implementation. We are not short of good laws. We are short of enforcement. The execution gap between the intentions in the law and the practice on the ground is very wide. And I do hope that as Trinidad and Tobago, you will look at shortening the execution gap so the good intentions in the law do find fruition through enforcement. But you also need necessary legal reforms where necessary, or, uh, which need to complement integrity building. Like I said, we have to go beyond the law. We need to invest in integrity building, but you still need good laws. And I have in mind public procurement laws and regulations which are transparent and aligned to international standards. These are inevitable for a country such as Trinidad and Tobago. Similarly, you need to deal with campaign financing regulations. And this is important in order to ensure that proceeds of corruption, proceeds of money laundering and other vices do not enter the electoral process. Like I said, once this is done, it does affect the quality of the leadership that you end up uh, working with. I want to also congratulate you for the work you're doing with schools. And I cannot help but remark that probably we are a lost generation as far as fighting corruption is concerned. But that does not mean we should lose the next generation. Like I said, our inertia should not affect the future of the next generation. So I thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to you, and I wish you great success in the work that you're doing. Thank you very much.